Hey YouTube, in this video I'm going to be talking about the solution to a cool programming problem for what is the depth of a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube. If you're not sure what that means, don't worry just yet. I'll explain it better in a little bit. Um, people might be coming from both backgrounds who are watching this video. You might be from the Rubik's Cube world, you might be from the programming world, um, and I'm going to be explaining the basics for both. Um, so if I'm going in depth on things you already know very well, um, just bear with me. Uh, but I will say that if you know one or the other or you don't know either, uh, this video will still be great for you. Um, the programming is, is very basic, so if you're from the Rubik's Cube world and you don't know any programming, uh, this might be a great excuse to start. And the opposite is true as well. If you're a programmer and you don't know anything about Rubik's Cubes, it's fine. You don't need to know how to solve them. Um, there's very basic knowledge you need to be able to solve this problem. And with that being said, um, I'll add that this is a solved problem. The answer is very well known. So if you want to try to solve it on your own and you don't already know the answer, don't go Googling because um, you'll spoil it for yourself. All right, so I'll quickly try to explain to you what I mean by depth when I ask what is the depth of a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube. Um, first of all, if you're not from the Rubik's Cube world, this is a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube. Um, not nearly as popular as the 3x3 three three Rubik's Cube that you're probably more used to, um, but this is just a simpler version. And essentially, when you're talking about the depth of a case, all you're talking about is how many moves away it is from being solved. So if I were to do something like that, this is now a depth one case. Um, its optimal solution is one move. If I were to then make a second move, this is now depth two, so to speak. Um, and of course, you could solve this case in 100 moves, but because the, the best solution is two moves, it's a depth two case. And um, the question is, what is the depth of the deepest case? So um, as you can imagine, if you start scrambling it and making turns, um, each move you make will be making it deeper. It'll make it more scrambled. Um, but eventually, you're essentially just beating a dead horse. It's not going into deeper levels. It's just going to sort of stop. It might even get um, less scrambled. You might even be making solving moves and not know it. Um, so the question is, what is the depth of the deepest case? And the reason why that's such an important question is because when you solve that, then you can safely say that every two by two Rubik's cube can be solved in X moves or less, where X is the smallest number such that that's still true. Okay, so you might be wondering, why not just ask the same question with the three by three Rubik's cube? It's the most popular one, it's the one everyone knows. Why are we solving this one? Um, and the answer is simply that this is very hard. Um, in fact, the answer to that question is so hard that it wasn't even known until 2010. So it went unsolved for 36 years, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but it's essentially a massive computational project that nobody watching this video has any sort of resource to. I'll post the link if you want to see more details on that. Uh, but that problem is extremely hard. And then on the opposite end, you have something like this where this problem is so easy that you could solve it by hand. This is a two by two by one, and it only has six cases, and this is a depth three puzzle. Um, I will, spoiler alert, give away that the three by three Rubik's Cube is a depth 20 puzzle. Wasn't known until 2010, and as you could probably guess, this is somewhere in between. But this two by two is the perfect example of a programming problem because this is something that's so easy that you could solve it on your own. This is something so difficult that even with the help of a computer, you'd never be able to do it by yourself. And this is hard enough that you could never solve it on your own. There's about three and a half million different cases this could be scrambled into. Um, but it's easy enough that on your run of the mill single core machine, you could write a program to solve the answer to it. So that's why I picked this for the topic of the video. So hopefully that was good enough of an explanation for you to understand what the problem is actually asking. Uh, one final note before I move on to the solution part of the video, I just want to define what a single turn is considered. You can make a clockwise quarter turn, a clockwise or a counterclockwise quarter turn, or a half turn on any face. So this still, this 180 degree turn still counts as a single move. So that's allowed, and hopefully that's enough for you to be able to understand the problem you're trying to solve. And I'm going to go into the solution part now. So if you want to try to solve it on your own without any help, I would suggest pausing the video now. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, stay for the solution. So the most important thing to realize about solving this problem is that you want to work backwards. You definitely don't want to generate every position, try to solve it optimally, and then figure out which one is the longest. That would be way too much work. You have a starting position, you have the solve cube. It's better to work from there and go backwards. Um, so one really important thing to realize is that if you have a scramble at a given depth, let's say it's depth n, and you make a move to it, it can only either stay the same, stay at n, it can go up to n plus one, which would mean one move more scrambled, or it can go down to n minus one, which would be one move closer to being solved. Um, and that's it. You can't have anything else. So for example, let's say we had a cube that was at depth five, meaning its best solution was five moves. You can't turn, you can't make a turn and end up at depth seven. Um, Cause for example, if a depth seven case is one move away from a depth five case, and that can be solved in five moves, that would imply that that depth seven case could be solved in one plus five, which is six moves, which would mean it was depth six. So if you have any other result outside of these three, something has gone wrong. And this is really helpful for deduction because if you're starting with a solved cube, you know that negative depths don't make any sense. So if you're at depth zero, every turn you make on the cube will bring you to depth one. And then if you start at depth one, if you take every case and apply every possible turn to it, and if that position doesn't already exist in depth zero or depth one, then you know for sure it exists in depth two. And you can use that to generate every position in depth two. And you can do the same thing with depth two. If you make any move to it, and it's not a position that already exists in depth two or depth one, then it must exist in depth three, and so on. And the cool thing about this is if you continue doing this, eventually you'll reach a depth n, where if you go through every position in depth n, and apply every possible turn to every position in depth n, all of the resulting scrambles will either exist in depth n or go into n minus one. None of them will become more scrambled. And once you figure out what depth that is, that's the answer to the problem. That's the depth of the cube. And it's really neat to think about that there are positions on the cube where you could hand them to someone and say, scramble this, and they wouldn't be able to because the, the case is as deep as it gets, so even though they might start making random turns to the cube, they would actually be solving it, which is really counterintuitive and strange to think about, but they actually can't make the cube more scrambled than it already is. And once you've figured out what that number is, that's the answer to the problem. So now I'll step through the code. Uh, I'll try not to take too long since this video is already getting sort of long. Um, this solution is in Python. It's only two files, but um, to your surprise, this is pretty much the whole solution in this file. If you were expecting more code, it's really, really not that bad. Um, this first import is just for moves, and this time import is unnecessary. It's just strictly there to help me see how long the process is taking. And this is sort of the first important line. This is the structure I'm using to represent the positions. It's just a string of sticker colors in an arbitrary order around the cube, like white, green, orange, blue so on and so forth. Keep in mind, this is by no means the best way to represent a position. Um, there are much more efficient ways you can represent a position with much less data. The reason I'm doing it this way is for speed. Um, applying a turn to this is just a one-liner. It's really fast and easy, and I figure it's worth you know storing a little bit extra data per position. Um, this function is really important, get moves. It takes in a position and it returns back a list of every uh, move applied to that position. Um, there are only nine of them um, because you can make a clockwise quarter turn, counterclockwise quarter turn, or half turn to each face. And you'll notice they're only performed on the front, the right, and the up faces because it's a two by two. So a left turn moves half the puzzle, a right turn moves half the puzzle, and they perform exactly the same move. So you don't need to do all of them. And as you can imagine, this function is very useful for solving this sort of problem. And pretty much the whole thing is done in these few lines of code in the solve problem. Um, these moves are hard-coded in the moves file. I'll quickly show this. Don't get intimidated by this. All this is doing is taking 
the stickers in the order they're in, it's chopping them up and then it's returning them in the order they should be if the move was applied, like a front turn or a front inverted turn. Um, don't get bogged down by these details. It's really not the important part, but these are where all the moves are listed. And this is essentially the main loop. Um, so I start the timer, not necessary, but it's interesting to know how long it takes. Um, the distributions, this is the most important data structure in this entire program. This is what holds um, all of the positions and all of the depths. So it is a list of sets. So for example, depth zero, which is this first set here, is just only the solve position, right? The solve position is the only one that can be solved in zero turns, obviously. And then in depth one here, we have a set of get moves of the solve position. So if you pass the solve position in here, you perform all nine moves, that's gonna be your depth one. And this structure here will get appended with depth two, depth three, depth four, so on and so forth. And at this point, I wanna add that it's very important that this is a list of sets. If there's any important programming lesson that exists in this video, it's this part, that this could, for example, this would absolutely not work if this were a list of lists. So instead of this being a set, if this were a list, that would be bad. And the reason is because this problem relies heavily upon lookup. And what I mean by that is you need to determine does a position exist in a given depth and make decisions based on whether or not it does. So because this is a set, this is hashed. So lookup is rapid. And if it were a list, in order to determine if a position exists in that depth, the way Python does it under the hood is it essentially checks each individual item one by one, and that would be absolutely impossible for this sort of problem. You could imagine with the amount of lookup we're using. Um, so I don't want to turn this into a hashing video, but it's very important that the depths are represented with sets and not with lists, um, just based on the way the lookup works with Python. And this is the main loop. And if you're familiar with Python, this is probably satisfying to see, but if you're not, I'll explain what this means. All this is checking is if the last depth, minus one, refers to the index of the final item. It just checks to see whether or not it's empty. And if it's empty, then the problem ends. And if it's not, then it just keeps going. So although I know the answer to this problem, this program is completely agnostic. Like it doesn't have hard-coded that you know some number is actually the depth. This will run until the problem solves out. Um, so basically, while ever, whenever there's uh, positions to be solved, it'll keep going. And then after it's realized that the last set is not empty, it then adds an empty set, and then it's gonna start populating it. So it will run through every position in the second to last which is now the same one we were referencing here, but because we added a set to the end, it's now the second to last. It will run through every position, and in every position, it will apply every turn. Remember, this get moves function is gonna apply every move to whatever position we're passing in and return the list back, and we'll store that in sort of a sub position. And then it's very simple. You check, does it exist in the last depth, which would be our n plus one case, because we added the empty set, does it exist in the current set, the n case? And does it exist in the n minus one case, you know, solving the cube? And based on that, you decide whether or not you're adding it to the final depth that you're working with. And that's it, that's the whole problem. It's that simple. This will run until you reach the end. And then here I have some print statements to give some information uh, while we're watching it so it's not boring. But yeah, that's essentially it. Just with this and some hard-coded moves. Once again, these are one-liners, even though visually I've separated them into several lines, um, but they're hard-coded. And yeah, it's actually a relatively simple solution. Okay, so now that the code is written, we're gonna run it. Um, I've opened up a terminal and I'm running Python in it. I've imported the search file and now I'm about to run search.solve. And the second I hit the enter key and run that function, it's going to start uh, spitting out information about each depth and how many positions exist in it. So I'm going to do that right now. And as you can see, um, the first couple positions went almost instantaneously just because there are so few positions in them. 
um, but now it's starting to slow down because it has to chop through um, essentially what has become millions of positions. Um, so you can see it just finished eight. It should be hitting nine soon. And there's nine. Um, nine is actually the peak with 1.8 million positions. Um, it's not only the most, but it's more than every other depth combined. Um, so nine will be the longest because it has the most to check through. Um, but nonetheless, it should be hitting 10 and the rest soon. And once it finds the last case, which is the one with zero, the program will end and it will say how long it took. Um, so as you can see, 10 should be finishing soon. And there's 10. And this is all real time, by the way, which I'm so sure you could tell. And should be done very soon. And there we have it. So you can see it was able to find 2,644 positions in depth 11. And then it ran through depth 12. And it was not able to find a single position for depth 12, meaning it went through every position in depth 11, applied every turn, and they all either existed in depth 10 or depth 11. So depth 12 was empty, the loop stopped. And this whole program ran in about a minute. Um, and as you can see, the depth of 2x2 two two is 11 which is the problem we were trying to solve. And that is the solution. So of course, this took about a minute because this program isn't really fine tuned for speed. There are a lot of ways it could be improved. It's more meant as an educational tool, but I'd be curious to see if you guys are able to write, uh, write a program to solve this. I'm sure you could do it much, much faster than this. Um, and yeah, I hope you learned something. I hope this was interesting for you. So I thought this video would be a good way of kicking off the channel. If you like content like this, let me know in the comment section. If you have ideas for other videos in the future, also let me know there. Um, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, please like and share. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you.